By the mid-1980s, it was apparent that the grain of America was real. Health costs were soaring and lawmakers of every political stripe faced the dilemma how to pay for Medicare, Medicaid, and other programs for growing numbers of older Americans, especially given the looming aging of the baby boom generation. It was and is a bipartisan dilemma. How will we respond when the largest generation in American history needs even greater medical and long-term care? There were unwise and false solutions in the 1980s and 1990s that fortunately were not adopted. They ranged from rationing health care against older people to levying price controls against innovative new medical treatments. The best answer, of course, is always to learn, to discover, and to innovate. Medical science has the power to prevent, postpone, and treat diseases and disabilities more effectively. This is our best response to threatening silver tsunami of chronic diseases of aging from cancer to Alzheimer's, from heart disease and stroke to diabetes. In our initial discussions with folks on Capitol Hill, it was widely assumed that research of such value already enjoyed the backing of the most powerful of all voices in the Capitol, the so-called gray lobby of senior citizen organizations. But that was not the case. The established well-known lobbies that speak for older people have very different, albeit important, priorities. The benefits and services their current members receive in the here and now. Investments in biomedical research did not have vocal champions among the mainstream seniors groups. We had to start something new. We began by issuing a white paper describing a nonprofit organization that would make the case for advancing and spreading scientific research with the goal of preventing and postponing the diseases of aging. In a matter of weeks, we established a scientific advisory board that included three Nobel laureates, two deans of major medical schools, and other prominent science leaders. We next pulled together members of Congress who agreed to be listed as policy advisors. We were careful to have an equal number of Republicans and Democrats. Getting such endorsements would probably not happen today, but in the 1980s we were able to count among our friends on Capitol Hill Senators John Glenn, Chuck Grassley, Orrin Hatch, and Edward Kennedy, and in the House, titans such as Edward Roybal of California and Claude Pepper of Florida. Armed with lists of supportive scientists plus influential members of Congress, we approached heads of foundations and top business executives to form a nonprofit board of directors. The Alliance's first chairman was David R. Carpenter, chairman, president, and CEO of Transamerica Occidental Life in Los Angeles. Soon, we were filling the board with other top executives of life insurance companies. Then, we were joined by Merck's Dr. Roy Vagelos, who was voted America's most admired CEO by the business press several years in a row. When Dr. Vagelos agreed to come on the Alliance board, we were deluged by pharmaceutical companies wanting to be part of our governance team. We made the decision then to limit participation at the board level by any one sector of the American corporate world, whether insurance, biopharmaceutical, or other. Our second and longtime chairman was John L. Steffens of Merrill Lynch, known to his friends simply as Lonnie. To draw attention to the new organization, we threw a party for ourselves on Capitol Hill. We persuaded the big three of the senior lobby, AARP, the National Council on Aging, and the National Council of Senior Citizens, to send out invitations as co-hosts, welcoming a new kid into the charmed circle. 